Hey, welcome to Fresh Start Ministries. My name is Pastor Joe Cordovano, and we want to just start this session off with... So for those of you watching on social media, thinking, oh, gee whiz, what did I get into? Uh, that's just a little private joke between me and the guys. What you're about to witness, those of you that are watching, is a real live recovery class setting. We're allowing you to join in with us. The guys are allowing you to join in with them in a real life teaching about real life recovery. And so we want to invite you in, ask you to just join us, and um, hopefully you'll get something out of it. And we'll go on from there. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, Father, we just we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for hardened hearts that can be softened only by you, Father. We thank you, Lord, that, that as one brother shared today, tonight, that It's not fresh start doing this, but you've allowed these men to come to a venue, a place where they can hear about you, Father. They can heal, hear about your, your healing love, Father God. Your care for them, your grace with them. Your love for them, Father. Lord, they can hear about not being adopted children, but being children of God. Father, we just give this time to you and we just ask, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would just guide us in all that we say and do. Father, that as this teaching goes out that you put on my heart to, to give tonight, Father, That as you tell us in your word, it will not fall on hardened hearts. It will not fall on hardened ground, but it will fall on good, fertile ground and take root in people's lives, Lord. Father, for those who have never heard this subject before that we're about to teach and share on, I pray, Lord, that this would be a revelation for them. That it would be just mind-boggling, not in a bad way, but in a good way, that recovery and Christianity can be so easy. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have kind of discussions, short, long. I'm not sure exactly how this is going to go. But a bunch of discussions on recovery and inner healing. And, and I'm going to share this with you. For those of you here in, in, in class, if you're, if you're already in phase two or beyond, then this is going to be just a refresher course for you. If you're not in phase two yet, then this is going to be a revelation for you. For those watching, many of you, this could be a real revelation Needless to say, that originally the Lord put on my heart that I was supposed to teach about long-term recovery. Because we don't talk about long-term recovery, what we do around here, but the world in general doesn't really teach about long-term recovery too much. But we do. And then as I was praying and thinking on, on that and meditating on that, then God showed me, well, the only way we can have long-term recovery, real long-term recovery, is if we couple it with inner healing. Because that's the only way we're going to have, the, the, as the Lord says, the peace that surpasses all understanding. That peace that's better than any drug, any alcohol, any addiction that we have, any life-controlling problem that we have, better than any of that better than any piece of jewelry, any type of clothing, 
whatever it is you used to get your your that used to get you up. There's peace that surpasses all understanding is better than any of that. And I really believe that if we don't teach this and we don't get this on film, then somewhere down the road, it could be lost. Because the world as it is in the, in the new generation coming up, they don't put the two together, recovery and inner healing. Inner healing, if, you, if it's even talked about in church, is just a church thing, a Christian thing, and recovery is just recovery. That's where the problem lies. See, some of you came in this in this ministry to achieve recovery. And I'm serious. If that's all you've come to achieve, if that's all you wanted to achieve, you can get that here at Fresh Start. But I'm here to tell you there is so much more than just white knuckling it and holding on for dear life and thinking that's making it and that's some kind of life you got going on. We don't have to white knuckle it. We can, we can tiptoe and skip through the tulips or whatever the life, having fun, enjoying ourselves. And I'll be honest with you, not even thinking about, gee, I wonder what it would be like to take a drink. Now, that's not going to happen for you guys right away, obviously. But I'll be honest with you. That's where I'm at right now. I'll be honest with you. That's where most of my staff is at right now. We don't think about if something goes wrong or we get a, a little bump in the road. Oh, my God. Maybe I'll just go out and get drunk or maybe I'll just go out and get high. That's the furthest thing from my mind. And even when it does come into my mind, because I'm not going to lie to you, it does periodically. I'm so far along, I already know what God can do in my life, and I just kick that thought right to the curb. And that's what, hopefully, that's what we'll teach you in the next few sessions here in these discussions about recovery, because that's really what this is going to be. I know I'm going to be teaching, and I'd really like to have a discussion group going on, except that we don't, we're not set up for, for people to hear your questions and, and get the answers. So, so it's going to be kind of like me talking and but in a discussion type of thing. So, when we first decide to, to find help, when we first decide to, that we, would, we think we would like to experience some kind of sobriety in our lives, and whether you come into a program like this or, or one like this, or this one, or however you do it, and when, I'm not here to argue what's what's good, what's not good. All I'm here to argue is the best is recovery with Jesus Christ, and that's what we have to offer around here. But handling sobriety sometimes can be difficult, can it? I mean, again, there's no sense in lying. Sobriety is difficult. And sobriety, long-term sobriety, is really difficult because Really what we're talking about is, what we're talking about here at Fresh Start is, is our long-term sobriety is all about the healing of our soul. Okay? Or, yeah, that's right. We got, I forgot we had that. Our mind and our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotion. See, all those three areas need to get healing if you want long-term sobriety. Because if you just heal your mind and your thinking, then you still have and we'll talk about this, but then you're still going to have negative negative emotions going on that are going to kind of crowd in on your today. And the thing is, is we don't know really how deep our emotional scars are, our emotional wounds are. We don't know that until we get sobriety. It's kind of like a catch-22. you got to get sober in order to realize you have wounds. You have to get sober in order to realize what long-term sobriety is really about. See, if it was as easy as, as going to detox, 
three days, five days, 10 days, and that's all it took, then that would be great, wouldn't it? Because most of us would have taken that route. I'm sure you would have taken that route. But those of you that have taken the route of detox know good and well that it doesn't work. So then, well, maybe maybe what I need is a little bit longer. So I'll go to a 28-day a program or a 30-day or whatever it is program. 28 days is what we usually talk about. And and I say, well, that's that's good. That's great. The only problem with that is, especially those of us that have been drinking, and most of us have been drinking and doing drugs at the same time. So what happens is, is our brain from drinking is swelled up. And in 28 days, your brain is just going back to the place where it should be and the size it should be to where you're thinking like a normal human being. And in 28 days, what's a 28-day program doing? They're patting you on the back, telling you have a nice life. You're all cured. Now, I'm, again, I'm not making fun of these programs. A lot of you had to try all those first. All I'm saying is I don't think they work. That's my own personal opinion. If I thought they worked, I would have made this a 28-day program. We would have been pushing out graduates like it was no, going out of style, man. We'd just be popping them out left and right. But 28 days isn't, isn't even enough to, 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 to start thinking straight again. So we need longer than that. I personally believe, and, and I'm not trying to do this for you guys, but for those that are watching for the first time, I personally believe that a year-long program is what is needed and a year-long program is what is needed because in a year's time, those in recovery in that program will have gone through every negative memory, every traumatic thing that has gone on in their lives, death, divorces, breakups, um, jail time, whatever is, is going on, you will have gone through it, that all of it and in hopes that you and your counselor will be able to help you work through that so that when you finally graduate the next year, you'll be prepared somewhat, I'm not going to say totally, but somewhat prepared on how to deal with that stuff. But that, it's only good, that only works and I know this is a cliche and it's it's one of those bumper sticker answers that I keep telling you I don't like, but it only works if you work it. And, and you know, we have guys that come in here and, and I'll be honest with you, we've had guys come in here, graduate and, and go out and dr drink and celebrate it after that. Thinking they some they got something, and really in reality they didn't get anything. Because if they would have had if they would have had what I'm getting ready to talk about, then 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 they would have been living in the present and worrying about the present and not the not the future or not and not the or not the uh, the uh, past. So as I was saying, we had these deep emotional wounds. And, and and they're there. We can't change it. It's a fact of life. If you went through anything, anything that looked like trauma in your life, say, well, what is real trauma? Well, trauma is anything that happens that, that affects you. It's anything, actually, it's anything that you perceive that has happened that affects you. So you didn't even really have to happen. You could have just thought it happened. You could have been telling yourself all these years, this really happened only to find out it was just the way you looked at it. It was just the way you perceived it to be. It really wasn't that way. But see, that doesn't make any difference because once you perceive something to be a certain way, then you live your life under those conditions. Does that make any sense to anybody in here? I'm not going to ask if it makes sense to them because I can't see them answering me. So it doesn't, but, it, but you know, because if I need to, I'll, I'll, st I'll spend all, all night on that and we'll just talk about that. But that's, that's reality. 
Okay, it's reality. It's it's kind of like like nowadays. One political party, well, both political parties, but one perceives the other to be a certain way and do certain things and are certain um, rebels, so to speak, political rebels. And then the political rebel party looks at the other party as a bunch of hypocrites and all they want to do is change the world to make it some kind of socialist society or whatever you get was it none of that may be actually happening but see each side is perceiving the other side to be that way so guess what each side is going to act like the other side like they the, the way they perceive the other side does that make sense so in other words you're gonna you may have grown up in a really with a really great two with a really great parent or two parents, or whatever it is, in a really fabulous family, but for some reason, you disconnected, or you felt disconnected from that family, and you grew up feeling disconnected, so you grew up, even though maybe your parents didn't do anything like this, but you grew up as a child of an alcoholic, coming out of an alcoholic family, an adult child of an alcoholic, and that's where you're at right now, and it doesn't make any difference whether that really happened or not, what makes a difference is, do you perceive it that way or not? So again, to just give you a, a, a quick example, and I can only use myself. So my dad grew up very poor. Not going to get into my grandfather who was stone cold alcoholic and, and piece of garbage. Okay. So my dad my dad didn't have a childhood. He didn't he wasn't able to have fun. He was always watching out for his mother and his two sisters. And and because my grandfather didn't. And he was always having to go um even as a as a kid go to the local bars and because he'd get word that that somebody's getting ready to clock my grandfather or something because he had a he used to get really nasty when he drank. And say really stupid stuff. So my dad wasn't, and my dad, so my dad grew up not an alcoholic. But because he wanted us, my brother and I, to have everything he never had, he worked a lot. And because he worked a lot, I only saw him basically only saw him on on Sundays. And I mean, unless I got up early before he left and had breakfast with him or something like that. What I'm getting at is if you would have asked all my friends back then <clears throat> whose family they would like to be a part of, most of them would tell you they would have liked to have been a part of my family because they thought my family, my parents were really cool, and which they were. Obviously, you could tell by me. They had to be cool. I got the jeans. Um, just kidding. But, you know, but I didn't grow up that way. I grew up just like if my dad was an alcoholic and wasn't in the house. Because he wasn't in the house. He never made it to any of my games. He never coached any of my any of my teams that I was part of. He never came to any football games. My mother would show up. But you know how embarrassing that is? to a defensive tackle to have mommy running behind you with his handkerchief telling you to blow your nose because it's stinking cold out and it's snowing. This was up in New York, obviously. And she's like, Joseph, Joseph, blow your nose. That's disgusting. Leave me alone, mom, get away. <clears throat> I mean, she tried, but the bottom line is I needed my dad there and he wasn't there, but he wasn't there because he didn't want to be there. He wasn't there because then we would have everything we ever wanted. We, we were the first family to have a colored TV on our block. We were the, I was, we were the, my brother and I were the first kids to have Stingray bicycles. Yeah, you don't even know what a bicycle is till you rode a Stingray. Had a shock absorber, had a banana seat, 
Ours were, were speckled. They were they painted custom paint. We had the streamers going. Man, y'all know me. I had the bling, man. Mine was gold. Gold metal flake. My brother's was blue. No big deal. But mine was gold. And I rode that thing. Whew, I used to watch that sucker. Seriously. I used to wash it and wax it. I love that bike, but that's 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 what I'm saying. See, I perceive my dad as not being a part of my life. And he was trying to do the best he could with what he had to work with. But I grew up like he was absent from the family. And so I grew up just like any other person that came out of an alcoholic family with all the characteristics and all the, and all the garbage going on. And that's what I'm trying to get at. That's what I'm trying to show you. So we, 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 we have these scars, these emotional scars that are deep, deep scars and deep, deep wounds. And, and the thing about it is it's not like if somebody just came like with a machete and just gashed at your arm or something and you got a nice deep cut. It wasn't, it's not that easy. It's like little cuts. And then it would heal some, and then you get cut again, and then it would heal some, and then you get cut again. And before you know it, you didn't even you didn't even pay any, any attention. You just kept getting these emotional these emotional scars and these wounds. And the deeper the the more you got cut, the deeper the scar got, and the deeper the wound was. Does that make sense? Because that's what's happened to y'all. Happened to me, happened to you, emotionally. Now, you can sit there and not admit that. In that case, you're going to be bored stiff for the next couple of weeks as I teach. Or you could at least understand that and keep an open mind about it and try to see what God's saying in the next few weeks. Because that's really what this is all about. And and here's what goes on. So we have these feelings. And, and I don't know, let's just take two of them. Maybe we feel inferior. Maybe we feel insecure. We don't know why. We don't have a clue. All we know is here we are, stone cold sober now. And, you know, I'm feeling insecure and I'm feeling inferior to everybody else. I'm not as, as good as everybody else or not as good as my my bunk mates or whatever in, in your room. And, and, and now you're stone cold sober. See, in the past, what happened was those feelings were there all along, but you medicated those feelings. You did dope, you drank, whatever it is you did, you medicated those feelings. But now, because you're stone cold sober, those feelings are free to float up to the surface. Now, those same feelings that were there all along, now there's nothing to medicate them. There's nothing to, to dull the pain. And so they come to the surface. And here's where the problem lies. And this is why I say sometimes it's difficult to handle sobriety. Because if you don't have somebody helping you to handle that, because it is difficult to handle, when you get these feelings, you don't know what to do with them because you've never allowed them to surface before. And so here you are at Fresh Start Ministries. You're working all day. You're coming home. You got classes, whatever the case may be. And here you are. And then we graduate you. And you haven't really dealt with anything. And so what happens is it goes on out there, whether you're at Sober City or Transitional Housing or wherever you may be. But it happens again. You hadn't dealt with it correctly. You haven't learned how to deal with it. And so now the pain comes back. And now you don't know how to handle it. So you only can handle it the way you used to handle it before you came to Fresh Start. And that's by drinking or drugging. Does that make sense? 
Okay, good. I'm glad I'm making sense to some of y'all. I mean, even if I'm not, just keep appeasing me and nodding your heads and stuff, yes. It'll go a lot easier for you. So, so, so we have these things. Hold on, I'm getting like bogged down here. All right, I can't. I, I'm, I'm wrapped around the axle with this cord. Okay. <laughs> live. This is live, ladies and gentlemen. So, so let's just look at some of these things. Let's. Let's let's take memories because that's really where where our problem begins, doesn't it? In our memories, we 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 see something, taste something, smell something. It triggers a memory in our subconscious, comes up to the and then this is just really like like brain one hundred and one, less than one hundred and one, and it comes up from the back of your head somewhere in some file cabinet to the front of your head to the subconscious to the conscious part of your brain. And then the next thing you know, you're thinking about it and you're you're feeling pain over it and you got all the same feelings that you had while you were going through it. <laughs> and what happens is it's kind of like this. Um, hold on, let me get my so I can make sure I do this correctly. So we got um, our past, nothing new to you guys in the program, present and future. Okay, only we're going to change it up a little bit. So what I'm basically getting ready to talk about is, is that we have these life circumstances that, that happen to us, that, that whatever it is we see, smell, taste, touch, whatever, feel something, and it brings back those memories. And what it is is, it brings in, we have these negative memories or these negative life circumstances. We're just going to stop there. Good news is I didn't have to pass English as most of you know. And we, we have these negative life circumstances that come up. Thoughts, whatever it is. And then because we haven't really dealt with any of this, what happens is we are not really living in the present. So we're thinking about all this negative stuff in the present. So we're trying to filter negative or life circumstances through negative memories. And the only thing that can come out of this, and I hope this makes sense, is more negativity. I'll call it being sick. Okay. This this is like Christianity and, and recovery as simple as anybody could possibly make it. And so we go through these things this way, and each time it happens the same way, and each time it goes it gets filtered through negativity, and each time what we end up with is a negative future. Can anybody relate so far? Good, thank you. I thought I was in the right room. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what happens is, is that we basically, our negative memories short circuit our positive memories or our positive events. So what's going on, just to give you kind of, again, a for an example. So you may be having a lot of positive stuff going on here at Fresh Start. And it looks positive. And, and, and it's, it is positive. You've, you've gotten jobs. Guys have gotten raises. They've been made foremans and, and leads on their jobs. Uh, blessings that God has given you. Fines paid off. Cars bought. Kids talking to you for the first time in God knows how long. I mean, whatever. Your parents giving you to, you know, letting you stay in the house without without locking up all the jewelry and posters and everything else you can, you know, including the TV. Not that any of you would have ever done that, but just, you know, think about some of your friends. And so what happens is, is it's, it's, it's just, it's, it, here, 
I'm going to show you what happens. It's one big negative circle. And you go through that day in and day out, day in and day out. Now, you can come to Fresh Start, go through this while you're out there at work, and then all of a sudden change because you walk through the front doors at Fresh Start Ministries and you become something you're really not and you become like super Christian. You know my version of super Christian. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Blessings to you all. Blessings, my brothers. How do you feel? Fabulous in the name of the Lord. Okay. Oh. I understand theoretically that's true. But relationally speaking, nobody has that kind of day every day. And if you hadn't noticed, it's easy to have that kind of day while you're while you're an hour at church. Everybody has how you feel everybody feels great at church. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. What a wonderful Sunday. Yeah, easy. Easy stuff. Easy peasy. And then you have to leave church. I mean, I've seen some of you guys. You leave church, and the next thing, you're in each other's throats like animals. Because somebody didn't move fast enough, or you had to wait because somebody was getting prayed for or something. I don't know. Crazy stuff. And we revert back to exactly where we were because we don't really have it. What we have is some kind of some kind of portrayal of what we think a Christian's supposed to be. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I used to be the same person. I used to be the same thing. I go to church and every morning, me and my wife would want to kill each other because of the three kids in the car yelling and screaming at the kids. Yelling and screaming at one another. We pull in the parking lot, get out, walk in, it's all smiles. I should say, how's it going? I say, fabulous. How are you doing, man? Get done with church, shake hands, hug people, the whole bit, even pray. Get done with church, get back in the car, and we're right back at it again. Now, I know most pastors will not tell you that's true, but I'm telling you it's true. And then one day something happened. And I'll never forget this day. Because the guy that, that, that it happened with, his name happened to be Joe. And he was the, the, an usher. i have been going to this church for a very long time. And me and my wife just had a stinking battle. I mean, you know, throwing the, the D word around. We all might as well just go get divorced and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Get out. And we used to go in the same the same door in the in the sanctuary. And Joe was always at that same door. And this little guy, Joe, would say, Pastor Joe, how you doing, man? And this one day I finally couldn't take it anymore. I says, Seriously, you want to know? He said, Absolutely. I said, good, come in here a minute, a minute. Sit down over here. And I started telling them, this guy freaked out. You know why? Because they don't tell you how to handle that in usher school. You know what I'm saying? They just don't tell you. They tell you, be polite, be upbeat, be positive, smile a lot, praise God a lot, be, 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 whatever, be helpful. But God forbid somebody says, my freaking life is falling apart. Can I talk to you? It's like, Hello? Well, aren't you an usher? Isn't that what? You... But, 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 and poor Joe was never the same after that. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he changed. He changed. He went down to the other end of the church, the doors down there. <clears throat> I didn't see him much anymore. And even when I did see him, I noticed he'd see me and he'd run. Like, all of a sudden, you had stuff to do, seating people and all. And there was nobody there. He grabbed people out of the eye. Come here, man. You want to sit down over here? Come here. Well, no, I'm just kidding. Don't get me wrong. Joe was a great guy. He really, he was doing his job. He was, he was a good usher. 
but he wasn't a count. Ushers aren't supposed to be counselors. Okay. And I needed a counselor and I needed one real bad. I needed somebody that was going to speak into my life. Unfortunately, we didn't get that for about three more years till I went to Dunklin. But anyway, what I'm getting at is, I don't know why I went there. Anyway, what I'm getting at is, so, so you're going through these life circumstances, everything, the negative life circumstances, being, and you're negative in your thoughts. Let me just write that down. Your thinking, your thinker is negative. And so future becomes negative. So for instance here, let me give you another example. So let's say you have some of these negative thoughts, your insecurity, your, your inferiority, and somebody pays you a compliment. See, but the problem is that compliment that somebody's talking about over here, for those of you on camera, that's a person. And they're paying you a compliment, right? They're talking, they pay you a compliment. The problem is coming out, it's a compliment, but by the time it hits your life circumstances and things you've been through, it turns negative, right? Then once it turns negative here, then you start thinking about it and it gets even more negative. And then you go from this guy giving you a solid compliment to over here. Now this is you. That guy really doesn't care about me. He doesn't care. He doesn't give a hoot. He be, 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 whatever it is. He's just trying to get at me. Kind of like what we go through in a social gram around here. Huh? Yeah. Because isn't that exactly what happens? A bunch of guys are telling you things that they see, faults that they see in you in hopes that you'll change that around. And yet, what do we do? Some of us, not all of us, but what do we some? We, we process it this way, and it comes out as they're just trying to get me. They're setting me up. Fifteen guys said I'm dead, but I'm really not dead. No, you really are dead. No, you need to lay down and stop breathing, because if 15 people tell you you're dead that know you, you are dead, dude. You're seriously dead. And you need to quit breathing, but we fight it. I'm not dead. So what we have to do is we have to take these, these, these negative life circumstances. We have to change that. Okay. We have to change that. Now they can, they can start out as negative, but if we're living in the here and the now, and we're living for Jesus Christ today, and we filter him through the cross of Christ, which is basically not basically, but extremely positive and uplifting, and we filter it through that, then what do we get out the other side? I'll tell you what we get. We get positivity, don't we? We get health. And here's where some of you are making your mistake. You're playing this, but you're not really believing it. <clears throat> You're saying, you're saying, if I look this way, it's like that old thing. If I walk like a duck and quack like a duck, I'm going to be a duck. Okay, let me tell you something. There's no way that I'm walking and quacking like a duck that you're going to mistake me for a duck. Maybe a gorilla, maybe a monkey, maybe a lot of things, but not a duck. You know what I'm saying? I don't care how I walk. I don't care what goes on. And that's the truth. Because some of you, and I've been to church with some of you, and some of you dress for church to the nines. And I'm sitting next to you. And people come up that don't know us. And they come directly to the people sitting next to me who have a suit and tie looking like they just, you know, you are, oh, we're, we're with Fresh Start Ministries. Oh, it was so, it's so good to have you and like that. And I'm like, so this guy that's all dressed up for a change, he looks like the pastor. Me, I look like a client. You know what I'm saying? So what happens? They go to the guy all dressed up. That's what tells me sometimes we're full of garbage. We can dress up any way we want. 
We can do anything we want. We can, we can change our looks. We can do all kinds of stuff. But until you allow God to change you from the inside, then you're still going to be a pig on the inside. It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. And what I'm getting at is, is that we have got to get this concept down because we've got to stop playing church and playing Christian and allow God to do a serious work in our life if we want long-term recovery. Now, if you don't want long-term recovery, forget everything I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks. Just tune me out. Half of you are doing that anyway. But just tune me out. You know what I'm saying? But if you really want to change, I'm telling you, 40-something years of sobriety, I got this that thing down pat. I could be a, I've told many of you in the intake, I could be a complete, and I'll tell you people, I could be a complete idiot, a moron. But I got one thing that you don't have right now if you're watching this and you're suffering. I got sobriety. Sometimes I don't even know how I got there. Sometimes I have no clue how I've stayed sober this long. All I know is I got more sobriety than most of you in this room are old. So I figure, as dumb as I, I might be, I have got to be able to teach you something. And this is what it is I'm teaching you because this is the stuff I've learned. <clears throat> so what do we have to work with? You told us, Pastor Joe, what we don't have to work with, but what do we have to work with? And I'm glad you asked that question because I have the answer right here. What we have to work with is the present right here. Oosh. The present. Huh. Because when we're in the present, then the past can no longer be used as anything more than a reference point. See, here at Fresh Start, we have you go back to your past a lot of times, but not to beat yourself up, not to do, but to use it as a reference point. This is where the trauma started. This is where the negativity started. This is the pain that this circumstance caused me. Now I got to take it from that and see how I'm going to allow God to heal that and go on with my life. And what will happen is, is, and there's no other use for the past. I'm going to be honest with you. I know we teach you about the past all the time. I put it on the board a lot, past, present, future. But that's it, past. Do you ever see me hanging out in the past? No, I'm always going to the present and the future. I don't care how sick you were in the past. It doesn't make any difference. Because the bottom line is, whether you were very, 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 very sick or you're just a little sick compared to somebody else. Sick is sick. Doesn't make any difference. See, that's like, you know, like sometimes we compare ourselves to other alcoholics and drug addicts. Well, I'm glad I'm not as bad as that guy. Who said? Well, I've never been to jail. So what? You're fortunate. Thank God for it. And go on with life. But you know what? Your life was just as screwed up is a guy that just came out of prison for the last 25 years that made a mistake and didn't have a good enough lawyer. You've made plenty of those mistakes. I've made plenty of those mistakes. I just didn't have to pay the consequences for them. Not like that anyway. So, so we have to look at the present. We have to be able to... to uh, uh, let God utilize our present lives so we're no longer bound to our past. We're no longer we're no longer having to repeat the failures of our past. But part the problem is is we some of us have a one dimensional attitude where where the, the, we we're just looking at the consequences of our actions, and we don't take anything into consideration. Just the consequences of our actions. I went to jail. I must be a bad person. No, you could have been a good person that just really screwed up. I got news for you. As a matter of fact, I could just about tell you that's how God sees you. You're a good person that made a really dumb mistake. First dumb mistake was you, you probably didn't have a good enough lawyer. But we won't, we won't get into that 
and I'm not going to I'm not going to call out public defenders, but that's a whole other story. I mean, I don't know because I never had a public defender. Whenever I got in trouble, my dad bought me a lawyer. He didn't want our name smushed all over the, over our little town that we lived in. You know, funny part about it is he got busted for for for. Uh, well, it was back in the RICO days, RICO Act, and he got busted for for uh, possession of narcotics. We had the Nassau County cops, the state cops. We had New York South, New York North. We had Brooklyn. The only people we didn't have there was Queens. And they all converged at my house. Oh, and the FBI. Whoosh. Not boosh, boosh. And the bottom line is, we were in the, we were the headlines in our, in the in the paper, and and it was uh, it was uh, what the heck was it called Newsday on Long Island, and we were we were in for for weeks, weeks. So the very thing he used to pay for, so I wouldn't make make a fool out of our name, boom. We were splashed all over the. The only good thing is that we didn't have social media back then. It took a while for things to catch up with us. But you see what I'm getting at? So we had this one-dimensional attitude where we're just looking at the consequences of our actions and, and we're not taking into consideration. So what I'm getting at is, so all our focus is on one thing. Our focus is on what we desire, not what's best for us. Our focus is what I want. Our focus is on not the cost, but what I want. So this is where most of us go wrong because we're still in that. So we get in this mess, we feel this pain, and we don't focus on the cost like we try to teach you here, but we only focus on what do I want and what you want is to be done with the pain. The only way, the only two ways you know how to get done with the pain is number one, your drug of choice, and number two, Jesus Christ. But if you're not living in the present, then Jesus ain't in the picture. You only got one thing to, to put to, to hang your hat on, so to speak, and that's your past. And your past tells you, I gotta go get high because this is what I want. You don't care about. Your family's not going to talk to you again. You don't care about that you're going to let down your kids. You don't care about that you might spend the next 15 years in a in a in a in a in a human zoo because that's what I call jails and prisons, the human zoos. You don't care about that. All you care about is this hurts. I want to go get high. And what happens is some of you who haven't practiced the right way to do things leave here with your little certificate, your little neat little keychain, and in a day or two or a week, you're back out there ripping and riot, riot, running because you've learned absolutely nothing on how to put put this whole thing into 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 a process to get you, to keep you from from using. Does that make any sense? So what we need is we need a three dimensional attitude. We don't need we don't need a one dimensional where we're just dealing with me, myself, and I. Or we're, we're we're and we're not looking at how does my decision affect God? How does my decision affect myself? And then how does my decision affect other people? How is my decision going to affect my family? We don't think about that. We just think about one thing: I want what I want, and I want it now. And God ain't in the picture. You may have a really big butt cross. I mean, I wish I would have worn my really big cross. I got one of those, like, you know, like those. Somebody made it for me, but it weighs so much I can't, I'm like, I can't hardly wear it. But it's a big old cross, man. It looks like I could just start walking and witnessing. But we went, we got the crosses, we got the jewelry, we even got tattoos. Of Jesus Christ all over us. Jesus is my Savior. Big head of Jesus Christ on your back. 
you know? Amazing grace up your arms. Psalms, Rebbe, the whole thing written out. Doesn't mean nothing. Nothing. Why? You probably got it when you were in a drunken stupor in some tattoo parlor, and you thought that was cool. Or you thought, like I used to think, if I tattoo a, a cross on myself, then no matter what, if somebody ripped my cross off, my good luck charm, I'm good. I'm stuck because they're going to have to cut that one out. And so I'm still, I'm still protected. See, that's what you really thought, isn't it? And I got one of them big old butt things on my back, you know, cross, broken chains, big heart, whole bit. But I got it when I was, when I was like already 20 or 30 years serving the Lord. I mean, it, it really means something to me. I didn't get it because I was crocked out of my gourd. What do you want? Oh, I need a Lord. God, it's a, it's a cross on there. How big you are? I don't care. Okie dokie. Two hands with the thing, man. Is three people working on this cross all night. That's beautiful, but you got no clue what it means. I'm just saying, I'm not putting you all down if you got crosses and stuff. Like I said, I got them. And if you got it with that in mind, you know what? You could always you could always figure out what it means. You ever think about that? What it really means now. What that psalm or that that scripture on your arm or where it is, what it really means. What does it really mean? Now that you're walking with the Lord. So we have got to have three a three-dimensional attitude. Where we look past, but only to learn a lesson from it. We look at the past only so that we can change it in the future. We look at the past so we can plan a much better future for ourselves. And eventually, what's going to happen is you're going to start watching breaks occur in your armor. That armor you got on that's keeping everybody out, breaks are going to start occurring. And they're going to be caused by people you love and respect. People you know that are telling you the truth for your own good. But I'm going to be honest with you right now. Not only is that going to happen, but there's going to be connections that are not going to be able to be fixed. The what? Yeah, there's going to I know a guy right now he's got, I, I forget how many kids he's got, he's been in prison for oh god 20 something years, maybe even 30 <clears throat> three quarters of his kids talk to him a couple of them still don't there's nothing he can do about it can't change it, he's a Christian he's been walking with the Lord in, in the joint I used to write them. Now I don't have to write them. Now I can text them because now that's they got rights in. in so I can even do uh, what is that face to face thing there. But I ain't paying for that. He wants a picture. I'll give a picture. I'll do a selfie and send it to him if he wants to see what I look like. But you see, get what I'm getting at. So, so we need to understand that sometimes, sometimes there's nothing we can do that's going to help us connect that brokenness again. But we've got to keep going for our own good. What if it never happens? Then guess what? It never happens, man. There are some bridges that are just too destroyed. It's kind of like that bridge in Baltimore right now. It's a sad, it's a sad commentary. It's a sad thing. I'm not, I'm not, but it, but that's what I'm getting. I mean, you want a visual? Take that visual if you saw any of the pictures. The thing is destroyed. There's no like, let's take some good parts of it and put it back together again. No, it's destroyed. They got to start from scratch with pilings in the in the in 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 the ocean or wherever the bay, whatever wherever they're at, Chesapeake Bay, I guess it is. Piling brand new pilings and all that stuff. If any of you have ever drove drove to Tampa and you saw it, it took them what about thirty years 
to put that extension on on the bridge, the two lane bridge going from from here to Tampa. Yeah, you know, it was like forever. I go every six years, and every six years, I, holy, they got three more pilings in. How long does it take to freaking put a piling in? It does take a long time. I don't know anything about piling, so I'm just saying. But you get what I'm saying? Some bridges are not going to be, and you can't do anything about it. But what you can do is you can live in the present and allow Jesus Christ to deal with you in the present so that in the future, you don't make the same mistakes. The problem is, again, give you the flip side of, of when breaks occur, is sometimes we can't reconnect. When we can't reconnect, we feel incomplete. See, because we want to talk to our children. We want to to converse with our parents. We want, we're, we're getting a little bit better, and now we want to do the right thing. But the bottom line is it's not up to you. It's up to them. You can't do anything about it. All you can do is keep being a Christian and stay sober and keep doing the right thing. And maybe someday it'll all change, change around. But if it doesn't, guess what? When you start that new family, maybe you can do it right this time. <clears throat> and like I said, so when there's no reconnection, we feel incomplete. And then that causes frustration and sometimes even trauma. And then we have frustration and trauma and instead of going to God, instead of being in the positive, what do we do? That's right. We go right back here, and we cut God out again, and we're right back up to here where, where it's negative life circumstances, negative thinking, and your future is negative again. The good news is that God gave us a way to reconnect. And if you didn't take any notes and you really didn't listen, hear what I'm about to say. The first person you have to reconnect to is you. Huh? Yeah. The first person you have to reconnect to is you. So for those of you that here in, in class at Fresh Start that are not in phase two yet, then this is going to be a brand new revelation. For those of you that have been in phase two, then this is just going to be, hey, just a refresher course. But here's what I would do if I were you this week. I would write myself a forgiveness letter to yourself. You know how some people say, well, you know, write yourself, write your 16-year-old self a letter and, you know, how would you do it differently? Yeah, that's not... But write yourself a letter the guy that screwed his whole life up, write him a letter of forgiveness because you got to forgive you before you're going to be able to forgive anybody else. And if you don't start there, then the rest of my teachings in the next few weeks are going to be fruitless to you. But if it was me and you haven't been in phase two yet, because I know in phase two you've already done this, so if you haven't been, then I would write myself, I'd start out this week by writing myself a forgiveness letter. And then those of you here in the program, take it to your counselor and discuss it with your counselor. Every one of the counselors here at Fresh Start can help you with that. We're, we are well-versed in inner healing. If you're watching on YouTube or wherever you're watching on, go find yourself a counselor. Go find yourself a strong, mature Christian, somebody you trust, and talk to them about it. Bring the letter. Read the letter to them. See what they say. If they give you that goofy look and they, they're like, they don't know, you know, like they're just an usher and they don't have a clue, then go find somebody else, man. Because somebody out there knows is going to know what the heck you're talking about. Don't get discouraged because the usher on Sundays, who you, ha who you happen to have about two seconds worth of, hi, how are you? I'm fine. Great. Thank you. Bye. You know where you're going? Yeah, yeah, I'm with Fresh Start. We all sit in the same place. Okay, well, then I don't need to walk you down there. You get what I'm getting? You see where I'm coming from? 
So let God do the work in your life, but you're going to have to do it by forgiving yourself first. Amen? Let's pray. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you and praise you and worship your holy name. Father, help us to be strong. Help us, Lord, to have your wisdom. Help us, Lord, to have your courage to do the things we have to do to get the healing we need to get so that we can have long-term recovery and a, and a life with you long-term, Father. Help us, Lord, to begin to really trust in you and not just spout out a bunch of words, but really know that we know that we know that we know that you care about us. And you'll do the right thing by us as long as we do the right thing by you. Help us, Lord, to be that strong. Help us, Lord, Lord, to be that courageous. Help us, Lord, to have that much wisdom. Father, we just really thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, I'm not going to see you. Have a great Easter. We got great food. That